Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for those individuals who came back. And there's no time to waste. Let's get started again on our continuation. So uh, I gathered some feedback from our... So which topic do you want to tackle? Do you want ballistics or sa medical legal? Sa ballistics. Do you want ballistics or sa medical legal? Sa uh, forensic medicine. Do you want to tackle that? Forensic medicine? Forensics. I think, sir, they're much interested with forensics. So, okay, sir. So, I'll give the floor back to Sir Terence McBride. Sir Terence. So you want to get into the, the dirty stuff. Let me tell you a war story first. How many people know where the Galleria is in Makati? You all know that. You know about 10 years ago, they had a terrorist explosion. I was called in as a consultant. <laughs> the story was that some terrorists put a bomb into uh, the Galleria. And the what is the, uh, we call it the FBI, but you guys call it the MBI? Okay. So I was called in to consult because it was an explosion. By the way, I'm an explosion expert, also a firearms expert, and good at shooting people. Well, anyhow, I got called in and I reviewed everything. And the place and the time of occurrence was in the uh, shipping receiving area. Why would someone want to put a bomb in the shipping and receiving area? All there are in employees and items coming into the, uh, the store. If I was going to put a bomb in a place, I would put it in where it was going to cause the most damage and create the most damage. But shipping and receiving was not the place that I would put a bomb. And the blast came from outside within. Almost appeared like it was a from a vehicle. 
except that they don't park any vehicles there. The only vehicles that come in and out of that area is vehicles carrying stock for the stores. They back into a, a, a loading area and they offload their trucks and go and leave. Usually big trucks, truck and trailers or 18 wheelers. So w one of the things that I, uh, I do is code enforcement. So the engineers design a building Then a code enforcement officer reviews the plans and signs off on it for safety. Fire safety, electrical safety, plumbing safety. And as I was reviewing the plans, I found out that the uh, sewage system for the mall exceeded the municipalities sewer system. So the mall had to put holding tanks and release the sewage at nighttime so the municipality could accept a large amount of uh, sewage. So when, when you have sewage in a holding tank, you usually vent, vent the tank because of the methane gases. They didn't vent the holding tank, and they had over 3,000 gallons of raw sewage. Where did they put it? In the shipping and receiving areas, they dug a big hole and put the tanks there. And the only vent that there was was a clean-out vent. So they could clean out the particles or particulars that didn't go into the sewer. And it just happened to be in the center of the uh, shipping and receiving area. And it's the same area where the exhaust pipes from the trucks would be. And if you know those big buses and big trucks, the exhaust always go down and they're really hot. The tank was, be was venting itself through the uh, clean out. And on, on a nice hot summer day, methane gas came up, the trucks were there, and it blew up. So that wasn't a terrorist a bomb. That was an engineering failure. So the liability of that explosion, which was really, it was an explosion, but it wasn't a terrorist. It was the liability of the engineering people not to have a vented uh, tank. So you know what that means. It's called, it's called vicarious liability. And who pays for that? The engineering staff that designed the building? The owners of the building? The insurance company's not going to pay for, for that.
questions. How did I know this? How many people have gone to a gasoline station and got their cars filled up or someone's car filled up? Come on, guys, you got to help me here. You go to the gas station, you pull up to the gas pumps, and you need to get gas. What do you tell the attendant? 500 pesos, unleaded, right? Do you know where their tanks are? The storage tanks of a gas station? Underground, yeah. You ever smell gas when you're at a gas station? If you look by the, by the building or building, you'll see pipes going up. Those are vent pipes. And the gas expands on the heat, contracts when it's cold, and vents. Gas itself is not an explosive, but the vent is an explosive. So you got to vent that out so it doesn't blow up. Well, basic same thing with a sewer tank. The sewer tank needs a vent or the methane gas that's in the sewage will explode if you have an accelerant. And the heat from the shipping trucks, the trucks, cause the uh, vented methane gas, the sewage, that exploded. Now I'm going to bring it right back to you. A person dies, I don't know, if he gets shot or is stabbed to death, and he's dead for a couple days, he starts to expand. The methane gas in his stomach is trying to go somewhere. A lot of times, a dead person, their mouth opens up, and they vent themselves. If they don't, they will blow up. Nobody ever talks about that. You ever see an animal on the side of the road? Its feet are way up in the air like a dog, and its stomach gets real big?
Okay, now, when, when I was talking about the medical examiner to check the death, the, one of the things they do is they put a meat thermometer into their body and they can tell by the temperature of the uh, liver that they, before, well, rigor mortis is set in, they can tell by the temperature the time of death. Well, he's also venting the body the same way, so when he brings it back to do an autopsy, it's not gonna blow up on him. He's already vented it. Another thing, gravity takes over when you die. What I mean, if you die and you're on your back, all the blood is going to go to your back. If you die and you're on your stomach, all the body fluids, including the blood, will go to the front of you. And if you die and they hang you by your feet, the gravity brings all that to your head. And rig rigor mortis starts about an hour and a half after you die, your body stiffens up. So a lot of times a dead person will look pale. Usually they die with their back. So when you go to, uh, to a funeral, the funeral person, they suck all the fluids out of your body and they put formaldehyde in it to... Uh, <laughs> Preserve it for the three to five days that they have you there. They also cut the tendons in the back of your legs and in your arms so they, so they can fold your, your arms and make you look good. Now, let me get into shooting. And it really gets into uh, forensics and the shooting. One, I carried a 357 combat masterpiece. And I use uh, hollow points, serrated bullets. Now, th the reason I carried those bullets was when I shoot you, I only need one shot. And the serrated jacket, the 357, will put a hole in you about three eighths of an inch. The lead inside the bullet mushrooms, but the serrated jacket turns into a a blade, because it peels back, and the riflings in the barrel makes it go like this. So it goes in small, but it comes out big. And another thing is, I never shot anybody center mass. And the reason for that is, Everybody's wearing a bulletproof vest. Even the bad guys. They're, they're not stupid. And a lot of them have, have a plate in the vest. 
So with a 357, I'll knock you right off your feet. But if I do a headshot on you, yeah, yeah. It goes in little, and the whole back of your head comes out. There's no question. And I'm here today because that happens. I've been into many, many shootings. And, and a lot of my, my staff and my friends say, how come you just go into a combat stance and shoot? Because all the badass, they want to shoot cool. They all have automatics, and they all shoot sideways. That looks cool, but you can't aim. You got to go into a combat stance. The rear sights and the front sights is how you shoot. Shoot it sideways. You can't get your target, but I can. And I always shot single action. I pull the hammer back and squeeze the trigger. Go get a movie in Dirty Harry. He used the same gun I did. Mine was a 357, his was a 44. They're both magnums. I carried it for 30 years. I bought my own gun. It was manufactured by Smith & Western. And when I purchased it, I sent it back to the manufacturer, Smith & Western, and they acrosized it for me. They took it all apart, remachined it, and gave it back to me at no cost. And I had it for 30 years. I still have it, by the way. Okay. One of the stories I'm going to tell you now, I was in the department three weeks. You know I was in special forces. I was a ranger in the military. So that's where I got my weapons expertise from. I got a call from the desk sergeant. He says, Terry, they call me Terry. There's a uh, manufacturing company in the next town over. There was five hamlets, five small towns in the town of Orange Town. And in one of the hamlets, there was a metal processing company that did metal processing, and they used polyvinyl chloride, and they got a 55-gallon drum shipped to them on the loading platform. The, the person who was responsible for the shipping and receiving was off that day, and he told the truck driver, just leave it on the platform, in the sun and in the light. One of the engineers saw the 55-gallon drum 
and touched it. It was hot to the touch. And the 55-gallon drum was getting ready to explode. It needed venting. But they also had to evacuate everybody because they were afraid that if it touched it, it would spark and it would explode. So they needed to vent it, and they needed somebody to shoot it. At the top of the 55-gallon drum, there was an inch of air in that tank that I had to vent. Nobody in the police department would do it, and they had a SWAT team. So the lieutenant said, do you think you could do that? And I said, yes, I know I can shoot it. And I know I could put 100 yards, I can put it into uh, that spot. The next thing is, they have 8 millimeter Mausers with, with scopes on it. They're like AR-15s. And I said, if I was going to shoot it, I want to use my own rifle. And you know, another vicarious liability. What if you miss? I said, I'm not going to miss. I used a Russian rifle, the same type of Russian rifle that they used to shoot Kennedy. A bolt action, open sights, and I shot at a thousand yards. And I had to shoot right there, right there, a thousand yards. That's about five times the length of this basketball court. I was only in the police department less than six months. <laughs> That's why I got hired, because I was in special forces. So how did I do that? Well, I put my uh, car, police car, a thousand yards away, put a sandbag on the front hood, and then aim my gun. I had fixed sights. I put it to a thousand three hundred meters and pulled the trigger. Got the 55-gallon tank, and nobody died. Now I was asked about another question about the people at the World Trade Center. How did we identify them? And, and that was really difficult. We started off by fingerprinting. But people who jump out of buildings and there are 100 flights up, every bone in their body breaks. And there was 4,000 people that had to be identified. You don't look the same if you've been burned. You don't look the same if you jumped out of a building.
Normally, to identify somebody, it's fingerprints and DNA. They also use dental uh, records and take an imprint of their dental, their mouth. Most people go to a dentist on a regular basis. And a lot of people had relatives or friends that knew their, their people were in the, uh, the building at the time. One of the things that we did was we moved the bodies to Staten Island. So we had to take them to the water, which is less than 100 feet. And we put them on tugboats. And we brought them across the East River to Staten Island. And there was an ice skating rink there. and we laid them on the ice. And we started off by fingerprinting the ones we could, the ones that were burned. We went for the dental records and made imprints of their dental, their mouth. And the next ones, we did DNA samples. And we took DNA wherever we could. Some of the DNA came from other parts of their body. And of course, we would match them with their relatives that we knew. It took three months of 50 to 75 people doing that. Nobody talks about this stuff. Now, the FBI has fingerprints of everybody. Most, 99% of the people in the United States have been fingerprinted for one thing or another. Bad guys always get fingerprinted. And they always get a sample out of their mouth for DNA. Good guys get fingerprinted usually when they go to work. I know I've been fingerprinted about 25 or 30 times. When I went into the military, 
I got fingerprinted. Any civil service job you got, you get fingerprinted. If you hold a commercial driver's license, you get fingerprinted. If you fly a plane, you get fingerprinted. What else? If you volunteer for the Red Cross, you get fingerprinted. And they're all held in one place, in the FBI. And they're digitally recorded so I can fingerprint you, send it to the FBI, and in less than 30 minutes, if there's a file, I have it, I know who you are. DNA sample takes a little bit longer, but in three days I can get a DNA sample and find out who you are. Let's talk about drug testing. Oh, if I take drugs, it leaves my body in 72 hours if I smoke pot. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. If you smoke pot, don't let them take any of your hair because it stays in your hair for six months. And by the way, that's the first thing they take. Everybody thinks, oh, they pee in a uh, jar and that's all they do. Now let's get back to shooting. Shooting from a distance. What does the investigator do? He was standing on the stage here and a bullet came from one of those windows. How do I know? Because the window got broken out. Now lasers come into effect. We can see where it entered, your body. So we'll stand you up where you were, take a laser, and point it right from where the bullet came from, and it'll go all the way home. That third floor on the building next door, We can go there, we can look for cartridges, gunpowder residue. The cartridge will tell you what kind of gun it is, especially if it matches the bullet that we remove, the ME removes from your body. The laser's gonna tell me where it's at and I'm gonna find it. And then I'm going to get some DNA from where you put your hand and identify the perp. A well-trained law enforcement officer will get his man.
and I never lose. Questions? Go ahead, ask it. The dumb question is the one you don't ask. You don't have any questions? Okay. How about a one man riot squad? I got a call. <laughs> Motorcycle gang went to this bar. They were from Jersey. New York and New Jersey, right close by. They were tearing up the bar. The bar was the hog penny. I'm fairly new in the apartment. I get sent there and I see all these motorcycles lined up, maybe a hundred of them. Du, 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 du. You know, big motorcycles, they always put it on a kickstand. I drove over railroad tracks and I put my foot on the brakes and I slid into the first motorcycle. Ta ting, ta ting, ta ting, ta ting, ta ting. They all got knocked down. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> they stopped tearing up the bar, and they came outside. A hundred guys were pissed. Only one of me. Under my seat was a Remington pump shotgun, 12 gauge. I released that, took it outside, and pumped it. Everybody knows what that is. Twelve gauge, double O buck. There's thirty balls that are thirty caliber. If I shoot it at the ground, it'll go out, and I can get about thirty people with that one shot. But I didn't even need to do that because once they heard the click of the shotgun. They knew that I knew business, and I was a one-man riot squad. I stopped the uh, riot in the bar, and they were out to get me. When I pumped that shotgun, they knew what I could do, and that was the end of the riot. Psychology is a bitch. And if you notice, I give you my direct eye contact, and I'm not going to lose. And I be, may be 76 years old, 
but I can take every one of you on. Trust me. Or I'm going to die trying. I am a badass. And if you decide to go into the police department, you better be a badass too. I cannot lose. Even if it costs me my life, I am not going to lose. Questions? Hey, Terry, how many babies have you delivered? Yes, you do that. Especially if it's cold and there's snow outside and the EMS people cannot move their ambulance. Someone's having a baby. Who do you think's going to deliver it? I've delivered eight. One is a breech birth. You know what that is? Anybody here take first aid? Breach birth is instead of the head coming out, the feet come out. So you know what that means, don't you? Chances are the baby's going to die. Or you take your fat chubby hands and you stick it up in there find the head and twist it around and pull it out and then you cut off the umbilical cord you tie it in a knot and you got a healthy baby What else do I do? EMS people will not go to a scene where it's unsafe. Obviously, why? So what happens if you're in a gunfight and you get shot? That's why I trained EMTs, paramedics, and life support, we will do that, especially if it's your fellow officers. I'm going to stop the bleeding. I'm going to put a tourniquet on it. If you need a blood transfusion, I'm going to do it. If you're in a vehicle and the vehicle's crushed and there are people shooting at you and you got to remove your leg to save a life, I'm going to do it. And I'm a pretty good butcher. I can find the joint, cut it off, put a tourniquet on it, and get you safe. You may have a little trouble walking but you'll be alive. If you got shot in the chest and your lung collapse, I'll put my finger in that hole, stop the bleeding, and get air back into your lung. Any other questions? Sir, how do you collect a uh, fingerprint from dead bodies? 
That's a difficult question. Because rigor mortis has set in on a dead body, how can you roll them? You can't. But what you can do, you can break them. But what we usually do, you know what a fingerprint card looks like? You, you cut the card in strips and use a spoon. If it's a big hand, use a soup spoon. And that's what they call it. You put the fingerprint box on the inside the spoon and you roll the spoon on the fingerprint. Then you cut and paste. No, you physically cut and paste on another card. What if he doesn't have all five digits? The digit that's missing, you put an X in it and say missing. That happens a lot, especially in uh, people who are working machinists or people who work where they lose a finger. Today, they take your fingerprints digitally. The uh, technician puts on a pair of gloves. He takes your fingerprint on a pad, which goes into a computer. Years ago, we used to use ink, roll the ink on an on a, on a ink block, and then we'd roll your finger, then roll it onto the fingerprint card. I think I answered one question about no fingerprints. Well, you'll have a smudge, and all smudges are different too. But remember, DNA backs up the fingerprint card. Victim one, victim one, two, three, four, five. That's what you put a toe tag on him. Until you identify him, he's known as a John Doe one or Mary Jo one, two, three, four, five. And that's how we identify them as a, as a John Doe. And we'll send that to the FBI with the fingerprint cards. And they're going to come back with the John Doe one, alias Mary Jane Smith. Or there's no file. If there's no file, then they're known as a John Doe. Oh, you know the know what also identify? I love this. People like tattoos. On your fingerprint card, on the back part of it, identifying points. Right forearm, tattoo, whatever it is.
and they take a picture of it. And a lot of people have tattoos. And let me tell you, there are tattoos in places I never knew you could have it. What other identifying marks? Broken nose. When your nose gets broken, it, ha it has a certain, uh, <laughs> it's not straight or it has a bump in it. People's ears. You'd be surprised how many ears have been cut or removed. S especially down here. That's a good controlling factor, and it doesn't look like you're abusing anybody. Take your, take your pen, put it behind the ear, and then put your finger in front. Where the head goes, the body will follow. And just try it for yourself. Take your pen, put it behind the ear, and then go like that. Trust me, if they're sitting in the car and they don't want to get out, they will get out of the car. Something else, but I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. I'll just sit in the chair. Come on, one volunteer. You're a pretty big guy. Put the bottle down. How are you? Let me take take just these 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 two fingers, right? He'll go anywhere I want, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes. You want why? You know, we haven't talked about rape yet. You, I would use three fingers. Wait, sir, I'm a woman, sir. I know, I know. Go ahead. Uh, more? Nothing. Okay, everyone. But you could do that to the biggest guy. Yeah, I'm not going to put pressure on you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's talk about rape. That is a crime, you know. And it's one crime, if you come upon a person that's being raped, you can use deadly force.
And what, what is the age of consent in the Philippines? No, it's 13. Am I right? I think I'm right, 13. Yeah. Look it up. So, under the age of 13, they cannot give consent. Or even if they do give consent, it's still rape. And it is a violent crime. The next thing is, how are you going to charge a person with that? First thing, if you are raped, don't take a shower. Now we got to collect evidence. They have a rape kit, which is an envelope. And in the envelope, you're going to have a comb. You're going to comb your public hair. Then there's a swab in there that you're, going, you're not going to do it. A medical technician is going to do it. It's going to swab the area. And that's going to have DNA sample. Also, they're going to take your underpants, and there should be s samples of that on your underpants. And the detective will get the evidence and interview the perpetrator. Now the perpetrator is going to deny that he even knows you. Knowing that's, that's going to humiliate the female subject. But the DNA is going to be the best source of evidence you have. And of course, while they're combing your public hair, they may get some public hair that is not yours. And that has DNA on it also. Now, a lot of times, what they call day rape is they take and give you something, some kind of drug, so you don't know. Or they think you don't know. You know. Questions? Every emergency department has a rape kit.
So if that happens to you, go to the closest one, do that. What other crimes are there? How about child abuse? Pretty common in the States, especially in the summertime, is, oh, I, I only had to get a, a little milk in the store and I left my baby in the car seat, in the locked car. She was safe. But it was so hot she overheated and died. That's child abuse. And you know, more people are protective of their dog than of their kids. And you don't want me to be the investigating officer. Because you, you ain't going to hide from me. And I will hope and pray to God you resist my arrest. Any other questions? Five-year-old, oh, yes. sit down. You do a rape kit on a five-year-old. If there's penetration right off the bat, s something's wrong there. It should be a virgin, right? So if there's penetration, there's been a rape. Now, I'm not saying they put put their member in there, but if they put their finger in there, that's still rape as far as I'm concerned. If there's been penetration, that's been abuse of some sort. Any other crimes you want to know about? How do I know all this? One, through training, but there are three books that I use. It's called Criminal Procedure, that will tell me how to and what to do in a procedure of a crime. How do I know a crime has been committed? New York State has the New York State Penal Code, and that puts out what the, what the, the crime is I'm going to enforce. And uh, the next one is the New York State Vehicle and traffic law. <laughs> How
How do I make an arrest? There's a warrantless arrest or a ro arrest with a warrant. Have you ever heard of a red light ticket? You go through a red light and a, a camera takes your picture of your car and you, by the way, that's illegal. The only person who can give you a traffic ticket is a peace officer. A camera is not a peace officer. And a peace officer can give you a ticket for a violation today. I got stopped. And the, the, the violation was coding. What the hell is coding? Twenty years ago, when I first came to the Philippines, twenty years ago, right? Was it twenty years? Yeah, it's twenty years ago. My mother-in-law had an FX, Toyota FX, and she gave me keys to it. And by the way, I have that Toyota FX now. It's, it's mine. And I was driving in Makati, and the last digit number is nine. So that means on Friday, I can't to drive that car. So I got pulled over by a uh, traffic enforcement agent. And he said, you're not supposed to drive this car today. And I said, wait a minute. My mother-in-law said I could drive this car anytime, anywhere, just put gas in it. And you ain't my mother-in-law. He says, I'm going to have to give you a ticket, sir. You have violated the coding. And I told him, I said, you sure you want to do that? And he said, why? So he said, do you have a driver's license? I said, yes. I pulled out my driver's license. I gave it to him. And I said, I think you better call your supervisor first. He said, how am I going to call my supervisor? I said, you got a radio there? Call him. And, and say, tell him you're going to give a ticket to the chief of police in the state of New York on a violation. Rape? Rape is a forceful crime. One person attempting to penetrate another person without their permission. Can you be raped by another man? Or can a female rape another female? Yes, they can.
Ask, ask me some more about that. Okay. I didn't get that ticket 20 years ago, by the way. <laughs> I also got stopped twice here this morning. The car's parked downstairs. I didn't get a ticket. The, the officer's the second officer said, is that your car? I said, yeah. He says, do you know you're in violation? I said, but I told him I was coming here and it was important, and he let me go. The first person saw my shield. I don't think she spoke English or not good enough to, uh, she just said go. Have we figured out the rape yet? Oh, the shooting that I was talking about, the bishop, it happened three days ago in Los Angeles. Was it Los Angeles? California. And the, the gentleman that I was talking about, person of interest, was arrested. Well, in summary, it's been a pleasure Hello. talking to you. Hello. I think you got something out of it. If not, shame on me. If there's any questions that you may think about and you want me to answer them, tell my friend here, he'll contact me, and I'll be more than happy to answer it. Well, I'm still waiting for that rape. By the way, I'm going back to the States on the 1st. But I'll be back here next year for the winter time. If you ask me nicely, I can come back and I can do another class. And if you think about it, just about anything you think about, I know no. or knowledge of. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I am Professor Arnel Golan Sanchez. I'm connected here. As a part-time professor, I just want to ask. Hello. I just want to ask how uh, attempted and a prostrated rape committed in your country? Because here in the Philippines, we do not have prostrated rape, and rape under Republic Act 835 can be committed by a man and a woman, or a woman, vice versa. Kaya tayo mga kalalakihan, we have still the right, no? Ah. Uh, uh, just want to ask, attempted and prostrated rape, how it is committed in your country, sir? You're asking me how penetration occurs? No, sir. Attempted. Attempted. Uh, okay, a person of uh, legal status, that means can give consent 
Once they say no, thing goes on before, beyond that is an attempt. It doesn't have to penetrate to be attempted rape. If it's younger or minor, even if she or he gives consent, it's still rape and will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Satisfied? Yes. Yes. Prostated, prostated rape? Real easy. Once the person says no, and you continue to go on, you're going into the second stage of your rape. And it doesn't even have to be penetrated. Just the attempt is there. Does that satisfy your question? Trust me, guys get a lot of that, and they don't even know it. You know, you go out with somebody, and you're touching, and the next thing you know, the police officer's knocking on the door and saying, you know, there's an allegation of attempted rape. Sometimes it, it's a difficult situation. Did I satisfy that question? Did I, did I satisfy? Okay. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> uh, another thing. Here in the Philippines, they sort of accept a little bit, and that is spousal abuse. You don't want to call me to spousal abuse. And I know that happens quite a bit here. The same thing. If she says no, it's no. No ifs, buts about it. And in the States, if there's an injury on spousal abuse, the law enforcement officers mandated to arrest the abuser. It could be a he or a she. But if, if the gentleman slaps his wife and is a red mark or it looks like an injury, he's arrested. The officer will arrest the person and he will take photos 
of the said area that was injured and send you to the emergency room, the victim. And the person who caused that would be arrested. No ifs, ands, or buts. Go. Assault, you don't have to be injured. If I grab your hand and pull you, that's an assault. I've touched you. Did I injure you? No. Why did I pull your hand or pull you? You didn't give me permission to do that. You have your space. And nobody should go into your space. You know, like bullies try to just bump you. No, I don't, I don't need a drink. I'll tell you a good assault. An older person in charge of a younger person is pulling that young person, physically pulling them, and is mad at that little person because it doesn't want to go with you. I don't want to see that. That's a, that's a physical abuse of a child. And by the way, as a peace officer, Nobody touches you. They touch you, that's an assault. You're just doing your job. If you're a detective, you're asking questions. They can refuse to ask questions but they can't push you away or do anything to harm you. You're just doing your job. Pursuing to your duties. And police officers cannot be bullies either. There are good cops and there are bad cops. Well guys, I'm just about ready to go. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We've, we've raped people. We've murdered people today. We've identified and fingerprinted people.
We haven't got into any serious automobile accidents, but next time you might get that from me. Thank you very much. Sir, as a token of appreciation, our organization is, and school is awarding to you this certificate of appreciation. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for sharing to us your field of expertise in the criminal justice law. And uh, we would. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any words, sir? You like to say I hope I uh, said something of value to you gave you a little bit of information. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I think most of our participants here would like to take a picture with you, so is it okay? If you guys take a picture, okay. So let's. Uh, 20 pesos, no buy it. Okay, so I think uh, let's take a groupie and then those individuals who want to take a picture with Sir can go in front. So, stand up everybody. Let's gather up here. Ay. Okay. Okay, so okay na po ba? Okay. Let's wait for other people. Ay. Okay. So, everybody, one, two, three, cheese. All right, one, one more picture. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you very much uh, for those who would like to take a solo picture with Sir. Uh, ah, there's more. Okay, let's go. Come here, let's go. One, two, three, smile. Ma'am. Okay, one, two, three, smile. So, uh, a reminder to all our participants kindly uh, fill up the evaluation form. Ah, okay, go on. Okay, so
So reminder to all participants to kindly fill out the evaluation form. It is now posted in the it is now posted in our Facebook page and now we will be flashing it on the screen. Yeah. Okay, so flash on your screens right now is the QR code. So kindly scan the QR code now. So you can fill out the evaluation form in order for you to receive these certificates. Um, the running time for the serving of certificates would last to two to three working days.